In the early 1980s, I worked as a reactor physicist for the UK's Atomic Energy Authority. I left after a few years and followed a different career, but I've continued to be interested in nuclear power and I've kept up with the important and revolutionary developments that have been taking place. It's these revolutionary changes in nuclear power that I want to talk about. When I started at the Atomic Energy Authority, people were just beginning to become concerned about global warming. But nevertheless, nuclear power was unpopular due to valid concerns about safety, nuclear waste disposal and cost. These yellow stickers saying nuclear power no thanks were seen all over the place, from the back of Citroen 2 CVs to school satchels. And under successive governments, the UK's nuclear industry gradually reduced in size. A lot has changed since then, and it's now possible to make completely safe nuclear power stations that actually consume nuclear waste instead of producing it. And this can be done with no risk of the fuel being used to make nuclear weapons. There are several new ways of doing this and multiple new reactor designs have been proposed, all of which have their own particular benefits. But I want to focus on the stable salt reactor designed by Moltex Energy, because this design solves all of the problems associated with nuclear power and has a realistic chance of bringing about a significant reduction in global warming. The stable salt reactor is a unique type of fast reactor that has the nuclear fuel dissolved in liquid salt, which is kept inside thin metal tubes. These tubes sit in what is essentially a large bucket of liquid salt, which doesn't mix with the radioactive salt in the fuel tubes. This arrangement brings safety and cost advantages compared to other molten salt reactor designs. There are three variants of the reactor, but I'm only going to talk about the waste burning variant, which uses nuclear waste for fuel. I'd like to point out that I have no financial interest in Multex Energy or any other nuclear power company. My motivation in talking about this is simply to help to protect our environment. There are about 30 slides and a short video clip in this presentation. I'll explain how the stable salt reactor solves three big problems, nuclear waste, reactor safety, and cost, and then I'll take any questions afterwards if that's right. I want everybody to understand how the nuclear waste problem has been solved, so I need to first say a little bit about uranium, which is the fuel most commonly used for nuclear power. It's only a few slides, but it's important for an understanding of the subject. Okay, so natural uranium, as it's dug out of the ground, consists mostly of two types of uranium atoms mixed together. Uranium atoms with 235 nuclear particles in each atom and uranium atoms with 238 nuclear particles. The uranium-235 is a useful type that we can use to make nuclear power with. But as you can see in the graph, there isn't much of it in a block of uranium. By far the majority is uranium-238. The uranium-238 just gets in the way by absorbing the neutrons that cause the nuclear reactions. All the uranium on our planet was made a long time ago in the star that exploded before our sun even existed. And ever since it was made, the uranium-235 has been slowly decaying into atoms of lead. At about the time that multicellular life first appeared on Earth, uranium-235 formed about 3% of the uranium. Now it forms only 0.7%. Uranium-235 atoms easily split apart, releasing energy and releasing neutrons, some of which hit other uranium-235 atoms causing them to split apart, making more energy, and so on, creating a chain reaction that gives us nuclear power. Uranium-238 just absorbs neutrons without splitting or making energy, and that stops the chain reaction from happening. So if a block of uranium doesn't have enough uranium-235 in it, then a nuclear reaction isn't possible. To make nuclear power, we can enrich uranium by removing some of the uranium-238 to artificially increase the percentage of uranium-235. And we can also slow the neutrons down using what's called a moderator, because slower neutrons aren't absorbed by the uranium-238 so easily. So I hope you've got the idea. It's this small bit of uranium, the uranium-235, that makes the energy. The rest just gets in the way. About two billion years ago, when there was more uranium-235 than there is now, so it was easier for nuclear reactions to take place. There were at least 17 natural nuclear reactors operating in West Africa. This photo shows some scientists standing around looking at the remains of some of these natural reactors. When it rained on this ground, 
the rainwater acted as a moderator, which means it slowed the neutrons down, making them less easily absorbed by the uranium-238. And that meant that the neutrons could cause fission of uranium-235 atoms, and a nuclear chain reaction started up. Of course, it very quickly got hot and the water evaporated, so the reaction stopped until the ground became wet enough for it to start again. All 17 of these reactors ran like this for about a million years without ever having an overheating incident, because this control mechanism, based on the physics of the configuration, was fundamentally safe. The reactors have what we call a negative void coefficient, meaning that if the coolant disappears, the reactor stops. I'll come back to this later on. Anyway, I think it's interesting that there used to be nuclear reactors on Earth before humans were around. I don't think many people know that, but let me get back to more recent times. So just to recap, the uranium that we put into traditional nuclear reactors is mostly useless uranium-238, but mixed in with it is a small amount of reactive uranium-235. What comes out of the reactor after many years of operation is a horrible mess. Nuclear reactors use up the tiny amount of uranium-235, but in doing so, they contaminate all of what was harmless uranium-238 with nuclear ashes. The proper term is fission products, but I think that nuclear ashes is more descriptive. These nuclear ashes remain dangerous for 300 years. The other thing that contaminates the uranium at this stage is the various actinides that are formed in the reactor. Actinides are elements like plutonium, which are near uranium in the periodic table, and many remain dangerously radioactive for 100,000 years or more. This is a big part of the problem with current nuclear power. We use a tiny amount of uranium, just the uranium-235, and we end up with a large amount of radioactive mess. All of the world's high-level nuclear waste is currently in temporary storage facilities, such as the pond shown in this slide. The blue light is produced by the nuclear waste, which is emitting particles at over the speed of light in water. It's equivalent of a sonic boom for an aircraft going at over the speed of sound in air, but instead it's from particles going at over the local speed of light in the water. The waste carries on producing this light for many years. Beautiful, but dangerous. The long-term plan has always been to eventually store the waste underground when it has lost enough of its radioactivity. But it must then be kept isolated from the environment for several hundred thousand years before it's completely safe. There is some doubt about whether this can be done reliably. There are currently various plans for underground storage facilities, such as this one shown here in Finland, but so far no waste has actually been stored like this. It doesn't look like a great solution. Well, there is a much better way of dealing with the waste. We can process the waste using an electro-refining system to remove the nuclear ashes and then use the remaining mix of uranium and actinides as fuel for a stable salt reactor. This slide shows the existing dangerous nuclear waste that we've talked about in the bottom left corner. This is fed into the electro-refiner where the nuclear ashes are separated out and stored safely for 300 years. The remaining mix is then put into the stable salt reactor, where some of the useless uranium-238 becomes converted into useful fuel, as I'll explain in the next slide. The waste from the stable salt reactor then goes back into the electro-refiner and the process goes round and round multiple times until all we have left is the nuclear ashes. These nuclear ashes only need to be stored for 300 years because after that their radiation level will have dropped down to the background level so they're no longer dangerous. There are easy ways of storing nuclear waste for 300 years, so disposing of the nuclear ashes isn't a problem. Incidentally, the ashes, nuclear ashes, from all the electricity generation for a person's lifetime would be the size of a golf ball. So the total volume of nuclear ashes that needs to be stored for 300 years is easily manageable. Now, because all of the uranium, including the uranium-238, is used to make power, a lot more electricity is made than was made when the fuel was first used. About 100 times as much, in fact. So we're thinking about that for a moment. The stable salt reactor will take the waste that was produced by our nuclear power stations and make 100 times as much electricity as the conventional nuclear power station made when it produced the waste. That's a huge amount of electricity. In fact, if stable salt reactors were used to destroy all of the UK's existing waste, 
they would produce enough electricity to meet 100% of the UK's electrical demand for the next 400 years at the current rate of use of electricity, simply by using up the nuclear waste. This slide gives the explanation for where all the extra energy comes from. The stable salt reactor is a type of fast reactor. Inside a fast reactor, the uranium-238, which forms the majority of the waste, is gradually converted into plutonium-239, which is one of the actinides that the stable salt reactor uses as fuel. This is why we get so much energy from the waste. Nearly all of the uranium is gradually used up like this, instead of just using the small amount of uranium-235. Incidentally, the electro-refining process can't separate out the plutonium-239 from the other actinides in the waste. This is important because it means that the process isn't suitable for producing nuclear weapons. So the stable salt reactor takes existing nuclear waste and converts it into a much safer form that needs to be stored safely for only 300 years. And it makes 100 times as much electricity as was made when the uranium was first used in a conventional nuclear reactor. But what about safety? A well-known problem with traditional nuclear power is the possibility of an accident. This too has been completely solved by the stable salt reactor. The first thing I want to say about this is that nuclear power stations can't blow up like a nuclear bomb. It simply isn't possible because of the uranium-238. The fuel required to make a nuclear bomb is highly specialised and very pure, with almost no uranium-238 present. However, other types of explosion, steam pressure in the case of Chernobyl, or a hydrogen and oxygen explosion, but both at Fukushima and at Chernobyl, are possible. And then as a result of the explosion, leaks of radioactive gases can occur. Nearly all nuclear reactors contain the fuel in fuel pins, similar to the one shown on the right in this slide. Highly radioactive cesium and iodine gases build up at high pressure in the fuel pins due to the nuclear fission. This is the real danger in a nuclear accident. If the gases escape due to a core meltdown or chemical explosion, then large areas of land can be dangerously contaminated. This is what happened at Chernobyl and Fukushima and nearly happened at Three Mile Island too. In the stable salt reactor, the fission gases produced in the nuclear reactions dissolve into the liquid salt in the fuel pins. So there's no gas buildup, and in the event of any sort of leak from the reactor, there are no gases to escape. The fuel pins don't even need to be sealed, so they're left open to atmospheric pressure. The primary coolant is also at atmospheric pressure, so there can't be an explosive release of pressure. The concept of contaminating large amounts of land simply doesn't exist with this sort of reactor. I just want to have a quick aside here because I don't think it's widely known that the possibility of accidents at both Chernobyl and Fukushima was predicted by the UK Atomic Energy Authority in the late 1970s. When I worked for the Atomic Energy Authority, my colleagues wanted the Soviets to close down the Chernobyl type reactors because the design was inherently unsafe. The reactor had a positive void coefficient, meaning that in the event that coolant was lost, the reactivity would increase. This is the opposite to the natural nuclear reactors found in West Africa. They ran for a million years without overheating because they had a negative void coefficient. So as the water evaporated, the nuclear reaction slows down. But going back to the Chernobyl accident, another problem was that there wasn't a secondary containment building around the reactor to stop gases escaping in the event of a core breach. This type of reactor would never have been licensed in the UK. Unfortunately, the UK had no influence over Soviet reactor design both the UK's Atomic Energy Authority and the US Nuclear Regulatory Commission advised the Japanese to tsunami-proof the Fukushima reactors by raising the height of the sea defence wall. The worry was that in the event of a large tsunami, the boiling water reactors might lose their electrical supply and that the backup generators weren't high enough above sea level and therefore they might fail to start and the, cool, the core would then overheat. The changes were discussed but never implemented because both the plant operator and Japan's nuclear regulator paid insufficient attention to the evidence of previous large tsunamis inundating the region around the plant. Boiling water reactors rely on an emergency power backup being available to keep the core cool for several days after shutdown. My colleagues at the Atomic Energy Authority said that this wasn't good enough, especially as the backup generators were too close to sea level. 
It wouldn't have been, it would have been much better if the reactors had been fundamentally safe instead of relying on safety systems working properly to keep them safe. So in both cases, the accidents that happened were predicted in detail by the UK's Atomic Energy Authority many years before they occurred. Nuclear reactors should be designed to be inherently safe. They should have walk away safety, which means that whatever happens, no corrective action is required and the reactor cannot be dangerous. OK, let's get back to modern nuclear power. There's a lot more to the stable salt reactor safety than the lack of fission gases. The reactor also has a negative reactivity coefficient. As it becomes hotter, the reaction slows down due to the physics, so the reactor is self-controlling and cannot overheat. This type of behaviour was demonstrated in the 1980s by the integral fast reactor, as shown in this video. By the way, this was the first reactor to use nuclear waste from other reactors as fuel. And in some ways, it could be considered to be the predecessor to the stable salt reactor, this short video is presented by the program director, Dr. Charles Till. Back in the 80s, it was clear to me that something had to be done. Something better than present day. About safety. And it wasn't only in safety. It was in uh, matters of waste as well, and in uh, uh, proliferation matters. Uh, and over all of those things, uh, the matter of economics. You can't make the plant impossibly expensive by making it too complicated. Go ahead and go up to the main parking lot there then. All right, thanks very much. So, in 1980, I was given the job of directing the entire program of advanced reactor development at Argonne National Laboratory. Our goal was to design a new type of reactor where the very physics of it would be such that it could withstand almost any type of accident that nuclear plants can be subject to. It was called the IFR, the Integral Fast Reactor. The budget was about $100 million a year. 1,500 people, scientists, engineers, supporting staff. This was a very big development program. But you've got to test it. Calculations don't tell you everything. You've got to have the big facilities that say, if we have an accident of this kind, what will happen? We will now start to set up for the test. We did two experiments to demonstrate some unique safety features that that reactor has that others don't have. And invited people from all over the world to come and witness it. Station blackout is a term that's used by NRC, the safety folks, to describe the situation where one loses all bulk AC power. You assume that you lose off-site power. You assume that you're getting no AC power from your own turbo generator. You assume that your first diesel started up and it failed to start up. The second one started to start up and it did also fail. So you end up dead in the water with no AC power. This experiment was almost a direct parallel to what happened at Fukushima. It was eerily similar. We ran a reactor at full power, disabled the shutdown system, so the operators had no ability to shut the reactor down. And we shut off the cooling system, didn't extract the heat, so we just let things get hotter. In most reactors, you can't do it. No reactor I know of would survive that accident. But you have a meltdown. The international audience were watching the temperature going up like that, straight up. They turned around like so to see if I was or if the Argonne guys were running. <laughs> By the time they looked up again, the, uh, the trace had turned like so and it was on its way down and uh, the reactor just quietly shut itself down. No action required of the operators, no action required of the safety systems, nothing. You could just stand back like this watch the dials if you wished, and the reactor shut itself down. 30 seconds till test time. Well, in the afternoon, we started the reactor up again and carried out the conditions responsible for the accident at Three Mile Island. Five, four, we shut off the pumps. Three, two, Just shut off the pumps. 
All major reactor accidents happen because of one thing, inadequate cooling. The IFR type reactor, which EBR2 was a prototype for, if you cut it off from the steam system so it cannot reject its heat, it will just shut itself down. So it can't melt down? No, it can't melt down. I wanted to show that video to demonstrate that a nuclear reactor could control itself by virtue of its design rather than through the action of the operators. But some of you might be wondering what's happened to these integral fast reactors. Well, the program was stopped in the early 1990s by an American administration that was against nuclear power. But there is now revised interest in the design and the first commercial build of an integral fast reactor is due to start very soon in the US. But it seems unlikely that many integral fast reactors would ever be built because they use liquid sodium as a coolant and that presents both a potential fire hazard and additional complexity. Just like the integral fast reactor that we saw in the video and the natural reactors in West Africa, the stable salt reactor becomes less reactive as it becomes hotter, so it simply can't overheat. There can't be a meltdown. It's so stable that it doesn't even have an operator controlling it. It just controls itself by virtue of the physics. If it gets hotter, the nuclear power reduces. If it gets colder, the power increases. There is a mechanism for turning it off for maintenance purposes, but that's all that's required. If the main cooling pumps that send the hot salt to the steam raisers were to stop, then the reactor would cool itself by natural convection of the air around the outside of the reactor. Cool air from the outside is drawn in and warm air is expelled by natural convection. And importantly, as there are no dangerous gases in the fuel pins, there can't possibly be a leak of gases into the environment. There aren't any radioactive gases to leak. Unlike most reactors in use around the world, a stable salt reactor can't have a steam explosion or a hydrogen explosion because no water or source of hydrogen is present in the reactor. And unlike the integral fast reactor we saw in the video, a liquid sodium fire also isn't a risk because there's no sodium in the reactor. Lots of nuclear reactors have graphite in the core to moderate the neutrons, but graphite can spontaneously catch fire when it's been exposed to neutrons for a long time. This caused the fire at wind scale and there was also a graphite fire at Chernobyl. The stable salt reactor doesn't need a moderator, so it has no graphite in the core. In short, there are no dangerous materials other than, than the nuclear fuel itself in a stable salt reactor. Terrorists armed with explosives might be able to damage the reactor, but they wouldn't be able to make a radiation hazard outside the reactor site. The reactor is completely safe. After all, it's essentially a bucket of hot salt. If nuclear power is too expensive, then it won't form a major part of the world's energy supply, and therefore it won't make much difference to climate change. Currently, it only produces 10% of the world's electricity. But if it can become cheap enough to displace fossil fuels, then it can be a large part of the solution to climate change, and it can help to end energy poverty. Hinkley Point C is being built to fill the UK's near-term gap in baseload electricity generation. It's a pressurised water reactor similar in concept to the reactor at Three Mile Island, but made more expensive due to the requirement to engineer greater safety into the design. Unlike the stable salt reactor, it isn't inherently safe. Instead, it needs expensive built-on safety systems. It's also a physically massive structure that has to be built on site. Expensive power stations like this will never be built in sufficient numbers to solve global warming. In order to really make a difference to global warming, there will have to be a large number of nuclear reactors operating around the world. So these reactors must be completely safe and they must solve the problem of nuclear waste. But they must also be so cheap that the electricity companies want to buy and operate them. The high power density of the stable salt reactor means that it is very small compared to traditional nuclear reactors. It's made in a factory and delivered to the site on a lorry. This is much cheaper than building individual large reactors on site and the faster build time makes financing easier. None of the pipework outside the re reactor vessel becomes radioactive, so maintenance of the steam turbine side of things is simple. The reactor itself does not become very radioactive in operation and is readily transportable. 
So decommissioning at the end of life is much easier and cheaper than with a conventional nuclear reactor. Detailed studies by an independent body have shown that the reactor is very cheap to build, about a third of the cost of a coal power station. And the fuel is free because companies that store nuclear waste will pay the operator for a stable salt reactor to take the waste away. The payment will cover the cost of the electro refining process. Because the molten salt coming out of the reactor is very hot at around 700 degrees centigrade, it can also be used when electricity demand is low to heat up additional molten salt in insulated storage tanks. And then the storage tanks can be used to assist in producing electricity at times of high demand. For this reason, it fits well with intermittent renewable sources of electricity. When renewables are providing enough electricity on their own, the stable salt reactor can heat up the storage tanks. And when renewables aren't doing so well, the reactor can power the grid with the help of heat from the storage tanks. This makes the system very flexible and particularly useful for filling the gaps from intermittent renewable supplies. Most nuclear reactors around the world are water cooled and therefore they output their heat at a much lower temperature, which means that they can't store energy in this manner. Also, the large conventional reactors are slow to respond to power demand changes and for economic reasons, they need to run at maximum power as much as possible anyway. This means that traditional nuclear is mostly suitable for baseload power generation. A further benefit of molten salt reactors is that the very high temperature of the molten salt can be used to directly produce hydrogen without using electrolysis. This is an efficient and economical way of producing large quantities of hydrogen. If you consider how the world's electricity is currently produced, it's obvious that to stop global warming, the fossil fuel power stations have to be replaced. Old coal power stations could have the dirty coal burning part removed and replaced with a much smaller stable salt reactor. The reactor is so safe that a safety zone around the reactor isn't required. The operating costs will be lower than when burning coal because there's no need to pay for fuel. The train loads of coal can stop. This chart shows a recent cost comparison of various methods of producing electricity. The stable salt reactor by Maltex will come in at the very bottom as the cheapest form of continuous power generation. The cost of electricity from stable salt reactors has been calculated by Atkins, which is an independent company with expertise in nuclear power. Perhaps it's not surprising that a project to build one of these reactors has already started. It's in Canada. Moltex are working with New Brunswick Power and expect to have the first stable salt reactor in service between 2028 and 2030. This picture shows the planned layout. The nuclear waste from Canada's reactors arrives at the reprocessing facility in the top right hand corner marked WATSS. Once reprocessed, it goes through the tunnel to the reactor marked SSRW, that's for Stable Salt Reactor Waste Burner. Hot liquid salt then goes to the turbine hall to make electricity. It also goes to the blue storage tanks that you can see in amongst the trees to keep an instant reserve of heat available to meet sudden electricity demand. The whole site takes up only 20 acres. So the stable salt reactor solves all of the problems with old fashioned nuclear power. Moltex say that in the UK, the first one could be in service by 2032. If hundreds of these reactors are to be built around the world, it would make a significant difference to climate change. But this is unlikely to happen without public support. So it's important that people become aware of the benefits of this type of new nuclear power. To summarize, modern nuclear power can get rid of our existing nuclear waste, be completely safe, make electricity very cheaply, and work well in conjunction with intermittent renewables. We could have a near future in which by far the majority of the world's energy comes from safe modern nuclear power. Transportation, industry, heating and so on can all be powered by electricity. The few exceptions such as long haul aircraft and shipping could be powered either by electrofuels produced by nuclear electricity or hydrogen produced by the heat from the nuclear reactor. There is no need for humanity to suffer from climate change or energy poverty. OK, that's all I wanted to say. There's a suggested reading list here for anybody who would like to investigate the subject further. I'll go back to the normal Zoom mode now and try to answer any questions that you might have.